present unto you King Charles, your undoubted King. Wherefore, all you who are come this day to do your homage and service, are you willing to do the same? God save King Charles. God save the King! God save the King! Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening and welcome. For the next hour, we're going to be discussing this book, Reporting Royalty, subtitle, Analyzing the Media and the Monarchy. I don't think we need to talk a great deal about the content because you probably know what's in it anyway or else you wouldn't be tuning in. But it's worth saying that it has a splendid cover designed by Dean Stockton, which shows us a house of cards with face cards and on the back, the coat of arms of the House of Windsor. Edited by John Mayer and Andrew Beck with Richard Lance Keeble, produced within three weeks of the coronation, which we were just witnessing. 22 people contributed randomly articles, which Andrew Beck and John Mayer have put into a very good order, and they all seem to hang together a lot better than perhaps had the matter been planned. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a good volume. It's a good read. Uh, but we don't need, don't need to hang about. Let's just get it onto it. Um, among those 22 contributors are three knights of the realm, so they personally should be acquainted with royalty, if only on one knee. Uh, and we're going to start with one of those knights, uh, a very distinguished uh, sophologist from the University of Strathclyde, Sir John Curtis, who you've seen many times, who is greatly in demand, uh, on broadcasting channels and radio because, one, he's objective, and two, he's authoritative, and three, he's impartial, and that is gold dust in this world. Uh, so what he has got to say, I listen to avidly because I know it's going to be 23 karat gold. So, Sir John, if you wouldn't mind going ahead, uh, we will sit back and listen. Thank you very much, Michael, for that very generous um, introduction. Uh, differences between the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland. 
And perhaps they're demonstrating the potential soft power of the monarchy in the in what has always been a rather difficult situation, perhaps helped to persuade people that the monarchy was a good idea. Well, if that was the case, when we come to more recently with one, the difficulties and bad publicity surrounding Prince Andrew, and two, the falling out between most of the royal family and the Sussexes, that certainly has been followed by the highest levels of support for either saying that the monarchy was not important or that it should be abolished. Another time series from Ipsos that goes back to 1993, it's somewhat more episodic, shows a very similar pattern, stable attitudes until we get to around 2011, 2012, when support for the monarchy goes up, and then Ipsos also finding more support for Republic than at any previous time. So we can get some idea of what makes the monarchy popular and what makes it less so. It becomes more popular if it's seen to be using to be diplomatically useful. It becomes less popular if there ends up being a sharp contrast between the image that the monarchy is trying to portray and the reality that seems to emerge in what in some respects otherwise seems to be the soap opera of the lives of members of the royal family. One other final point to make before I conclude. Um, which is the age difference in attitudes towards the monarchy. It has always been the case, as you can see, if you look here from the data from 1994, that younger people are always less keen on the monarchy than are older people. However, as you can see, if you compare the views of 18 to 34 year olds in 1994, when only 21% thought it was very important to have the monarchy, with their views in my 2015, when they were already in, our, in the 35 to 54 age group, by that stage, 37% of them thought it was very important to have the monarchy. The monarchy has tended to become more popular with people as people have aged. However, notice on the right-hand side, which is the most recent data, that the gap between younger and older people is now bigger than it ever has been. Or to put it slightly differently, the monarchy has even more ground to make up amongst uh, today's youngest generation than they've had to, to do with previous younger generations. And this is one of the areas where, to be honest, you can see where the monarchy has got work to do, if indeed it is going to uh, secure uh, long-term popular support uh, for its continuation. So John, thank you very much for that tour de force. Would you agree that although the gap is narrowing between the Republican support and support for the, the monarchy, that the approval rating of the royal family and members of it, the senior members, are such of such a level that any democratic politician in the Western world uh, would actually die for those figures of approval. And although in the Victorian age, uh, there were dozens of Republican clubs and five serious attempts uh, to kill, assassinate the Queen, Queen Victoria, uh, yeah. 120 years after her death, six reigns later, we've still got a monarchy. Uh, yes, I think you're entirely right, Mon uh, uh, Michael, that indeed uh, many a politician would die for the kinds of personal popularity um, that uh, the monarchy has. And I think probably at the moment, the House of Commons w probably would struggle for people to say that it's as good as an institution as the monarchy is. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, uh, to that extent, um, I, I, I agree with you. However, um, the fact that we did have people who were contemplating uh, protesting, albeit according to their accounts, peacefully uh, along the Mall uh, during the course of the uh, coronation uh, proceedings, that is not something we would have seen 20 years ago. And it is an indication that, yes, it's still a minority but it is a minority that does need now feel able to express its voice and a minority which when the police, you know, perhaps somewhat slightly over uh, overhandedly uh, tried to stop them uh, being expressed their views, the police did come in for some criticism. So I think we do now accept that it's right for people to question the monarchy if they wish to do so. And I think that is a relatively new, new development. I don't think we could disagree with that. I agree with that. I'm a Democrat. So, John, thank you very much up there in Scotland. Uh, we appreciated that. I'd like to now introduce our second very distinguished knight of the realm, Sir Anthony Selden, uh, a brilliant uh, historian who also manages to find time to be the principal of Epsom College. And that poor 
institution has undergone a terrible, tra terrible tragedy in recent days. Um, and I'm sure we can all express sympathy to him uh, on that behalf. And I am certain that the pupils and the staff of that college have benefited mightily from his leadership during this very testing and tragic time. But he's not here to talk about that. He's here to talk about matters of the monarchy. And I'm looking forward to hearing every single word, sir. Well, thank you very much and very nice to uh, be here. And uh, the media and the monarchy are a truly uh, fascinating uh, topic on which everyone will have views. But to me, uh, it boils down to three factors. Um, and if these three factors are followed, then the media response to the monarchy, which is all important, they have a symbiotic uh, relationship. Uh, the monarchy without the media would be nothing. Uh, the media without the monarchy would be bereft uh, of, uh, uh, of extraordinary photographs uh, and copy. Uh, so when does it go well from the point of view of the monarchy? Rule number one is good behaviour. And where the monarchy behaves uh, well and uh, with circumspection uh, and avoids uh, affairs and uh, tawdry financial uh, deals and being um, uh, involved with shoddy people, uh, if it avoids all those, um, then uh, the media has little uh, to get its teeth into. Uh, second golden rule of the three is uh, that uh, good um, use of events uh, to the monarch's favour. So uh, John Curtis there was mentioning the famous 2011 visit by Her Late Majesty the Queen to Ireland, uh, so symbolically important, and indeed to Northern Ireland. Uh, that is an example of uh, the monarchy uh, creating history uh, and in significant ways, the head of uh, state, the monarch has more influence than uh, the head of government, the prime minister. When visiting uh, presidents of United States, uh, France, uh, across Africa, across um, the world, visit London, they're often much keener on gre being greeted by the head of state uh, in Buckingham Palace or in uh, Windsor, typically, uh, than by the head of government to have um, uh, discussions on trade and defence matters, however important they may be. Uh, the real bite comes with the visit to the head of state, and don't for one second underestimate that power. Uh, similarly, in uh, disasters, if the monarchy gets it right, the Queen didn't over the Aberfan uh, disaster in the mid-1960s, uh, delayed that visit. Uh, but usually the monarchy gets it spot on, showing empathy, showing uh, good taste, turning up uh, in the uh, right way at the right time. Uh, those are significantly help. So the second factor is to do good works. And the third factor uh, is good media management. So what is good media management? Well, it's so obvious, you would think, uh, that the uh, well-paid consultants who advise the monarchy would completely get it, uh, but they don't seem to, or if they do, they don't have the power over the principles. And that is that you never um, uh, engage negatively uh, with the media, you never react. Uh, to a bad story. You simply pretend uh, not to notice. It is uh, pointless. It's like Canute um, at the beach uh, in Essex or wherever it was, uh, wanting the tide not to come in. You, uh, The media simply has no control. Uh, Harry um, uh, has an ambition of trying to uh, reform. His greatest project in life is to reform the media. Um, he has about as much chance as Canute, so never react, never criticise, uh, and never descend, or maybe some uh, listening, uh, what you might say, never ascend to the level of the media. Simply uh, take them uh, absolutely as they are, um, be pleasant, polite, uh, and never react, never complain. Um, so those three things, uh, uh, in a nutshell, get it. Get it. Uh, one, behave well, 
because good behavior will always uh, might make dull copy, uh, but bad behavior makes wonderful copy. And uh, whether uh, Edward VIII uh, or whether uh, Princess Margaret or whether um, uh, Prince Andrew or uh, Prince Harry, it gives them absolutely uh, golden opportunities. So good behavior and avoidance of bad behavior. Secondly, good works um, and avoiding apathy uh, and getting out there working uh, their crowns off uh, and coronets. And thirdly, uh, good media management, which means uh, absolutely totally unengaging uh, with it, never complaining about anything, uh, but just always smiling at the media and hoping for the best. That's so it, I think. It, so it, I, I, I agree with almost everything you've said. In fact, I think I agree with everything. But could I just point out that Edward VII uh, attracted a lot of scandal on the, on the behaviour of son, and he couldn't have been more popular. <laughs> he was known as Edward the Caresser, because of his uh, attraction to ladies or, the, or their attraction to him. And, of course, uh, Prince Tum Tum. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, doing a broadcast, love, so I can't speak. What time do you think you'll be home? Uh, can you hear me? Should I carry on? Have I disappeared? I, I can certainly hear you uh, there. Okay. But I think the point about uh, Edward uh, the Seventh uh, was that he didn't, uh, for all uh, the people loving him, uh, for his um, uh, his extracurricular activities, uh, as indeed they do Boris Johnson, uh, it's when they get into the top job that they're going to be, need to perform. Oh. And Edward VII, to the surprise of many from 1901 to 1910, uh, surprised many by stepping up uh, to the job. Uh, Boris Johnson disappointed many by stepping down to it and failing to rise well, to the challenge. He, so, it, was, uh, it was seen in retrospect as a golden age, the Edwardian era. He won the correct. Derby. Ordinary people loved him. And when it gets to 1914 and the Tommies are in the trenches, they're saying to each other, this terrible mess wouldn't have happened if King Teddy had been around because he'd have had a word with his nephew, the Kaiser, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II, and told him not to be so damn stupid. I mean, in retrospect, isn't the key to it, it was a, a, an era of relative prosperity and people enjoyed it and they rather enjoyed having a rather raffish king uh, for that period of time. Different, different eras, different responses. Um, up to a point, uh, but I think that his behaviour was significantly different when he was Prince of Wales, uh, when he uh, was spending a lot of money and um, uh, loved um, good luck, good living and, and a lot of women to his behaviour when he was the monarch for those nine years, when he conducted himself um, in a very different way. Uh, and uh, indeed, it was a shame that he did die um, when he didn't in 1910. Wow. But um, uh, knowing when to die is, is a good quality for a monarch, uh, which a lot of them don't get right. Yeah, I'm, I must just say, my mother was born two months before he died. He died in May 1910. She was born in March. So uh, I'm the son of, of an Edwardian in that sense. And isn't it an amazing thing with this monarchy of ours? Uh, on his deathbed, Queen Alexandra allowed his mistress-in-chief, Mrs. Alice Keppel, uh, to come to his deathbed and see him. And she was escorted out of the palace in tears. She was distraught. And of course, it was her great, great granddaughter, uh, Camilla Shand, who just married uh, and was crowned our new queen. Uh, indeed. And uh, uh, generally speaking, just let me make one final point. It is the uh, women who are much more savvy uh, than the men. Look at the job that Camilla is doing. Uh, look indeed uh, at, uh, obviously, uh, Kate. Uh, look at uh, Queen Anne, uh, look at Sophie. Um, there are four women. They are... Oh, okay. Kate. Gloria. Not... Um, well, indeed. Uh, but I think that what kills it with the media, and I think quite rightly, is any sense of entitlement, uh, where there is a sense of entitlement that the job is somehow, that they're born into, that they have some divine right, uh, which just appeared in the 17th century, uh, um, a right to be there. And frankly, the job is awfully difficult, 
people realise how bloody difficult it is. I mean, the media quite rightly, absolutely um, uh, uh, hits that for six. The sense of entitlement when the monarchy is deeply and profoundly unattractive. Uh, we saw it in Prince Andrew, and we may well carry on seeing it. I think we're seeing it in Harry. I mean, the truth is that uh, um, the country has done nothing, that uh, the monarchy will flourish, if, but only if they behave well, um, and if they do good deeds, and if they uh, don't interact uh, negatively with the media. So I think the three rules will continue to apply. Entitlement is the killer. As Queen Mary said, we love hospitals and we're never tired doing good works. But Sir Anthony, thank you very, very much indeed for your participation. I know you have to be awake by half hour. That's five minutes before half hour. You've done us proud. Thank you for taking part and thank you for your contribution to the book. Uh, to Deborah. Michael, I'd be very happy to talk to you right now. Fantastic. I'm really pleased that you're here. And uh, we, this is not a substitute. This is a huge improvement on listening to me. I'm going to tell you that. So we're joined now by Deborah David Wilson from Nottingham Trent University. I started my journalism 12 hours up the road, Mansfield Chronicle Advertiser. So I feel a certain kinship. And um, Deborah is going to talk about something I'm very interested in, and I'm sure we'll have you wrapped. And it's about broadcasting at Monarchy. Go ahead. Thanks so much, Michael. Um, well, I, like you, it would seem, was very interested in the very start of the origins of the relationship between royalty and broadcasting. Broadcasting in this country, of course, is marked by the start of the British Broadcasting Company in 1922. And despite the press coverage of royals at the time and some short films, which could be displayed to the public at that time, it was in the UK only when the BBC started the opportunity was presented for the construction of that royal media event, which we now all take for granted. Um, both the press and the newsreels were able to reflect on events which had already taken place. Uh, for example, Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee procession, 1897, was the first royal event to be captured on film, and that shared with an audience. But it soon became evident that broadcasting could present, even if sound alone at that time, the opportunity to witness such an event in real time. But the Crown at the time took some convincing, and it's fascinating to read. It was understandable, I suppose, that their position, of course, relied on a very large part on their reputation, and we've just been hearing about the importance of good behaviour and good works. And they relied on their dignity. That meant that there might not have been too much enthusiasm for being associated with what might turn out to be nothing more than a tawdry sideshow. Because when the BBC started, you could imagine, aside maybe from John Reith and a few others, that it would come to be regarded as a British institution. Uh, so the reigning monarch of that time, George V, could have been forgiven for rebutting Reith's many advances, and he did, over the next 10 years, uh, because Reith was very keen to get him to engage fully with the fledgling medium. And Reith had begun his campaign by presenting the king with his own wireless set in 1923, which it does seem the king graciously received. Of course, Reith's aim... behind you? Is this Deborah? Is this really not. I think I'm more likely to have been able to listen to our late queen's coronation on this particular wireless set, but it is one I'm very fond of, and it does still work. Okay, we like it. It's uh, vowels. Don't ask me to turn it on now in case it blows up. But yes, it does. It does still work. Um, but of course, Reith had many aims for the BBC. He thought that the BBC should have dignity. It should espouse the highest values and ideals. Uh, he was imbued by late Victorian values that he grew up in: betterment, good taste, respectability, etc. And he was of the opinion that what was fit to print was not necessarily fit to hear. The question of good taste was part of that process, establishing the respectability of the BBC, but the royals weren't necessarily to know that, or if they did, they wouldn't necessarily believe that Reith's values would be realised and could be relied on. And of course, they were probably influenced here by their acquaintance with the press, newspapers not being quite so blind by high ideals. Plus, there was a problem. George V didn't have the confidence he'd make a great broadcaster. Like all of us, I would say, he first... Uh, or at least we do at first, maybe we get used to it, he rather feared the microphone. 
So there were advances made to wear down his reticence when an agreement was reached that recordings could be made and broadcast from major events at which the royals might be speaking. The first achieved with the King's opening address at the British Empire Exhibition at Wembley Park in 1924. And that went down really well. And so Reith moved one step closer to his goal, although the King remained unconvinced. But Reith was determined. He thought the BBC could be a unifying force in society and the monarchy was a major part of the toolkit to help do that to strengthen that bond between the king and his people. And with Reed's desire for respectability to BBC, what was more respectable than the crown? What greater accolade could Reed have for his BBC than the royal seal of approval? He had support from key politicians. Um, they were keen for the king to speak to his subjects and to the empire via the wireless. Ramsay MacDonald in particular felt that the monarchy was pivotal for maintaining national unity. So the king's issues were undertaking some form at least of personal address on on the wireless, worn down bit by bit, uh, with the concerted efforts of two very influential, usually personal secretaries to the king, with himself, of course, and finally the prime minister. The king's anxiety about writing for broadcast was dealt with. It was arranged that Rudyard Kipling, no less, would write the first Christmas message. But overall, this whole process took 10 years. And in 1932, King George V broadcast like Christmas Day from Sandringham, that first Christmas message starting a traditional part of the Christmas Day for many families. Uh, it was deemed a great success for all those involved, and we had finally achieved what he wanted. The king was gratified by the response. And apparently all the listeners that he could have hoped for across the British Empire, British Empire near enough, had all been listening in. We could ensure that that would be possible by the time he broadcast at 3pm, which was the best time to bounce the signal around and get to as many countries as possible. Uh, and then... Along came the king's death only a few weeks later. That was covered on the wireless. The funeral a few weeks later, the eventual coronation of King George VI, and all of these combined together, began that construction of a very carefully crafted image of the monarchy, the mass consumption. It would be absolutely fascinating to hear what we might say right now about the BBC and other broadcasters and the royal events and scandals. Uh, we can probably guess, but other more esteemed contributors to this book will have a more informed perspective on that than I do. The royals themselves, who knows? They'll use the media when it suits them, and then maybe less, less happy when it does not. Rees wasn't able to get the microphones into the coronation of uh, 1937, was he? Because it was said that it couldn't be done because men standing in public houses with their caps on might actually listen to it. So he was ruled that public should not be allowed to hear. I mean, you've put a lot of this in, in the excellent article that you provided to reporting royalty. I find it uh, compelling. And of course, it reached the empire and he became later in, like, the grandpa of the empire. And he was actually a, a, a talented and natural broadcaster with a very affecting voice. So he was, he made it viable. And of course, we all know, we've seen the film, The King's Speech, that his uh, second son found it extraordinarily difficult to cope uh, with a new broadcasting medium, but didn't manage in his own way so to do. But uh, it, it's, uh, so the intended thing was with BBC wanted to be there. They, they were there, they got there. And it was that sort of relationship, a relationship of respect. Nothing wrong with respect if it's done. Um, and, and, and so on we went. Um, what do you think uh, is going to happen in the future? Do you think we're going to, because there is a, many, many channels now, many, many radio stations. Do you think we're going to have more and more pressure or more and more scandal stories? And what is the result of that going to be? Um, well, we dread to think, don't we? There are felt Far too many variables for us to deal with that to make a sort of an informed uh, prediction of where we might go next. But certainly, um, the the element of control that was employed by by the crown, their ability to say yes or no to whatever was being broadcast, that disappeared many many years ago. And there's no way they're going to be able to get that back, um, even if they managed to maintain some kind of relationship with um, the, the the main 
I hate to say mainstream media because it's taken on a life of its own in that phrase, but you know, the main media, BBC, the broadcasters, even if they could reach uh, a relationship with them that in, in endeavour to give them some control, they haven't got it elsewhere, so it's not going to happen. By large, do you think it's been a healthy relationship, talking about the BBC in particular, they didn't get competition from ITV until 1955, do you, and the radio stations came later. Do you think it's been a, a healthy uh, and a useful uh, relationship between between the two sides? It certainly started off as, as such. Uh, that reticence that uh, they showed to start off with, that eventual engagement, and I think in the, in, in the early years, in the early decades indeed, it was a, a healthy relationship. Both uh, the Royals and um, the BBC and the other broadcasters got an awful lot out of it. It served both their purposes extraordinarily well. But um, these days, unless it's tabloid, it's not really of, in, of interest to the audiences. So it's going to be incredibly difficult now for it to be considered anything other than an unhealthy relationship. Do you agree with me? I have very few heroes in broadcasting, worse none. I do have one in Richard Temple, uh, that he then reinvented the monarchy, the television age. And when I was only watching it at age 10, uh, when he, he whispered into his lip mic up in the rafters of, of Westminster Abbey using the historical present tense, the queen, the queen is crowned. I mean, I was 10 years old, but my hairs went up on the back of my neck. And it made it spiritually important. A, a spiritual element was vastly and missing from the recent coronation, in my humble opinion. You know, what with the, with the Archbishop and gentleman being on the crown saying, but that's in you, sir. You know, I thought it was absolutely appalling in many, 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 many ways. And the spirituality, which was central to it all, this is, this is a, the central thing about coronation, king pledging. His strength to the country was like a, a marriage service with the vows outside. The king and his people, a marriage service, and you missed, you missed all that. But that's just my personal view and old broadcaster and letting off steam. But do you not think that Dimbleby actually did them a huge favour in, in the way he imported royalty? And yet the BBC kept him on a 13-week contract, nothing, all his whole life. He had to go to them and say, uh, would you like me to do the trimming of the colour on Saturday? And they said, you know, these guys in the Scott Tush puppies in their corduroy jackets said to him, oh, we'll let you know, matey, we'll let you know. He died at 52, and all we ever got was a CBE, and, and the Queen sent half a dozen splits to non vintage champagne as he was dying of cancer. And I think, if anything, there was one thing, it wasn't reason necessary, I think it was somebody like Dimbleby. We went to the television age, he dawned. He was there and he made it made it viable. He made it made it real ordinary people like me. Dimbleby was an extraordinarily gifted uh, broadcaster and journalist in so many different ways. Um, the work he did reporting during the Second World War and also he in effect um, invented the illustrated news bulletin and and conceived what would be viable news values for uh, radio news bulletins uh, and put that in his pitch for a job in this place. He was, he was very gifted in a, in a number of different ways. So yes, I, I could not agree with you more. He was a fabulous broadcaster and did help very much create that, um, that royal event in a way that I'm sure nobody else could have done. Thank you very much indeed for your contribution to this hour and also to the book, of course. We're going to move on. I see here waiting patiently and nodding every now and then and enjoying it, definitely enjoying it. I mean, I think of MB of the Daily Telegraph, a very experienced reporter around the world. I didn't really ever overlap with him. I think I was one of the older people. I moved on by the time he was, uh, he was making a start for himself. Uh, but he has got a very, I've read his piece in the book. It's an excellent piece. I found myself nodding in agreement time after time. I'm going to uh, Robin, I know you're uh, uh, a member of John Mayer, so you've been shanghaied into this project, but you have good things to say, and I would like to hear them. Well, thank you very much, Michael. The reason why I didn't uh, cross the paths when you were at the BBC was because you were, were already up there in the start of the firmament, whereas uh, I was um, 
I was still in the trenches in the job. So, um, so I went on with the collaboration. I'm um, just my remarks. I said that I, I've been a working journalist all my life, but I'm also a convinced monarchist. I'm, I'm a small C conservative. And I think that uh, in the journalistic profession, not enough weight is given very often amongst in individuals, I mean, at a personal level, to the value of the monarchy. I think that um, it confers on the country stability. I think that it, um, it humanizes the state. It is an institution composed of individuals like ourselves, to which we can relate. And um, I think it's not coincidental that in Europe, there are 12 constitutional monarchies, I think. I think that's the right figure. Constitutional monarchy is amongst the most successful governmental forms anywhere in the world. If you look at constitutional monarchies around the world, they are amongst the most stable, the most prosperous, um, the freest uh, forms of, of, uh, of nationhood that we have. So that's my starting point on monarchy. I spent most of my working life as a BBC reporter, and I, I um, have strong views about the BBC itself. I think the BBC is being as faced about um, monarchy. Um, things reached then they did, and um, the shameful Muslim Bashir epicenter, when a BBC reporter working for its this famous current affairs program, Panorama, to a depth which even I, as a critic of the corporation, I'm difficult to believe. The idea that you would have documents to hear a clearly damaged and slightly fragile individual into giving a personal and, as it turned out, very damaging interview. Actually, I find that, or oh, I can't believe that the BBC will ever fall lower from that. What was striking to me about that episode as it unfolded was the way that at the time, BBC so celebrated this um, remarkable interview which they had landed. I think of them like scalp hunters. Um, there are certain journalists, and there are journalists within the BBC who certainly fall into this category, who are always on the hunt for the wounded animal. And at once they find them, they must be shown. That interview with Diana, of course, signaled the end of her marriage and the end of her active role as a participant in the royal family. Ten years later, the top brass of the BBC, commissioned a special program commemorating this marvelous interview which got in the program, which you can still find online. We'll see top brass um, reveling in their cleverness in how they landed this interview, the subterfuges that they used, the secrecy which surrounded it, and it's all settled all around, you know. Like Stubble all around the, uh, uh, in the boardroom of God Gunting House. They were hugging themselves with glee. They were affiliated. Can we call to the air of those people saying, What clever guy is we are? We went out to Eastbourne. We saw it in full seat. We didn't let Duke Halsey, the chairman, see it and got it on the air. What we clever. And then, of course, they had to go 180 degrees the other way. Yeah. Well, that, of course, is the denouement of the story because 15 years later, thanks to uh, the digging by uh, a freelance uh, reporter who uh, put together a, um, a program for ITV exposure on exactly how that story had been, had been got. And um, of course, the BBC was then plunged into sackcloth and ashes. Um, the uh, director general at the time. Um, and Tony Hall, um, from having been seen as somebody who was, I say, a pair of hands, an honorable man, 
a man who had done much to restore morale within the BBC was suddenly exposed as being, well, I should one phrase this. I mean, I think that naive, I say, actually naive, naive, but also somebody who, who went along with his, with his pal at the top of the BBC and this really actually disgraceful, um, journalistic adventure. No. Since we've had the with, uh, with, with Prince Andrew and, um, made this you know, isn't it greatly said to wonderful interviews she had with Prince Andrew. Well, and she certainly falls into my category of being skull hunt. I cannot see that anything very clever was done in that interview. And I think Prince Andrew is clumsy individual. I don't mean physically clumsy. I mean, he handles himself in public and the public does he handles himself clumsily. Um, he very naively against the wishes of his media advisor went into that interview and he, he paid a heavy price for it. Once again, there is great rejoicing and glee of BBC that this was achieved. Now, my point about this is, I think that you may well be a journalist. Um, if you are a journalist, you are still a citizen of this country and that we damage institutions like the monarchy at our peril. The idea that any sort of um, improvement will be wrought by switching to uh, become a republic is, I think, a curious nonsense. It would be divisive and it would be no end of an upset. It would make Brexit hell into insignificance where the Republican movement ever to get that sufficient momentum. But my, so just finally, like what I would say is that I met, I think, more Republicans in BBC uh, than I've ever met since I left the BBC. And at least one of your successes as a role correspondent was a man who frankly loaned the monarchy the people in it uh, and everything that stood for. You know, I, I can't disagree with a single word you've spoken. And to go back to something you did say, I pick it up. There are 43 wikis in the world, and there are 149 republics. And now, if I was just to try a test with everybody, would you prefer to live in Morocco or Syria? Would you prefer to live in Japan or China? Would you prefer to live in Australia or Indonesia? Would you prefer to live in Denmark or Lithuania? If you have chosen the first of those two pair, in the first of the pair in each of them, you chose the monarchy over a republic because the monarchies of the, of the world tend to be happier lands to live in. It's as simple as that, as far as I'm concerned. If it works, don't change it. After all, um, you know, when the republics of ancient world have been brought, they removed them, and what did they replace them with? They replaced them with a monarchy. So there's nothing intrinsically more modern about a republic. And people who have lived in republics, uh, which we can name, I won't go through with them, uh, know, know, know the reason why a, a monarchy tends to be a happy land to live in. Can I just say, Robert Nathan, thank you very much. We've got one last guest to get in because I want everybody to have a fair shout, and then maybe having a chance for other people to ask questions as well. Our last guest is Marcus Ryder, MBE, another one from the Sir Henry, Lady Henry Center, Media Diversity at Birmingham City University. Thank you for coming. Can I see him, please? Where is he? There he is. Is he there? Wave me. I'm, I'm there. I'm waiting. I'm here. You're on. You are on. Thank you for listening. You're on. The floor is yours. No. Thank you so much. I think um, the point that I want to make, when I made the book, is that our coverage of um, uh, media's coverage of World TV, and particular Britain's media coverage of World TV, highlights the real problem that we have with diversity, diversity of thought, which is a popular term in the BBC right now, and of course other 
was the media. You know, so, for example, if you look at the polling, assuming the polling is, is correct, um, a minority of Scots, less than um, about 45%, want the monarchy to continue. Now, 30% of Scots do not support the monarchy, and, and the rest, if you do the math, um, uh, are undecided as to what, whether they're from monarchy or, or, or but similarly, if you look at the polling of young people, 18 to 24, 40 percent of the UK support the monarchy, majority not support the monarchy. You can go to the that if you actually look at the minority, that Asian and minority ethnic, you know, it's 60% support to the idea of monarchy continuing. And so what you're seeing is whether you're a Republican, so my issue is not whether you're a or whether you're a monarchist. I don't think the British media actually reflect large sections of the population. And so you may get the occasional um, uh, Republican argument. Like if you look at the coverage of the coronation, if you look at the coverage of the Queen's death, um, that large swathe of the population, it was invented as a nation in mourning. And the reality is, is that large parts of the nation were money, there was no doubt, but there were large sections of the population that were not in money, and those views and that part of the population was not represented. Now, what I always hear is that, well, that is the trying to reflect those views. I would argue that at points, and really importantly, the national um, national trauma of the bench, that's the time when all views have to be represented. Otherwise, it feels that some people are truly British, and the BBC and British institutions represent them, and other people are British, but only convenient for them, for them to be so. Right? And so I think that the media has a problem of representing certain certain views, and these views proportionately um, uh, put on people that are uh, but the further away from London they are if they're minority young people etc I also think that this is reflective of the fact that often the media has a problem news media has a problem of reflecting opinions which aren't particularly um, uh, a party actually back to them and for the fact that there is a mainstream party, MP, that is really supporting publicism, I think that the media then, news media then had, does have a problem with having different opinions that may be very prevalent in the society if there isn't a political party actually supports those opinions, however prevalent they might be. You'd be surprised, I think, uh, Marcus, if I may say so, by how many people like me. Is what well the British is. If you're British, you're British. And that's it. As far as I'm concerned, many of British people, British ethnic minorities, people who come here for the second, third generation, whatever it is, they come from countries where they put up the Queen on the bank notes, on, on postage stamps, on post boxes, and uh, in some cases, singing God Save the Queen, and then, of course, Empire. Uh, was dismantled elegantly, probably most uh, bloodless, and ordered end of an empire ever anywhere in the world. And do you not think I think that things my I think my in laws I think my in laws who were Kenyan who were actually kept in concentration camps and stuck with actually human rights abuses would actually disagree with that. I think that my on my brother's family, which is Jamaican. People that were actually suppressed for the upright things right before to make independence and were actually slaughtered. People have been a bit of 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 a you know, against British occupation, but also picky with so I just can't let that just just slide. Sorry, but, but this is a discussion. 
and you not say, which I, I always feel that the British, it suits the British mentality, the British attempt to have, but have a monarchy for the simple reason that they can accept that somebody by right of birth becomes the head of the state, but they wouldn't like to go out and vote for, should we say, Richard Branson or uh, a Tony Blair or let them put themselves forward because by simply by putting themselves forward, they declare themselves to be the wrong sort of person you want Britain. So you could say to me that the stability that this country has and enjoys because it has a monarchy going back more than a thousand years, King Charles traces his ancestry back to Alfred the Great ninth century. You don't think that that is attractive to people who come here, they come to a stable country, a constitutional monarchy, where monarch is there at the, uh, at the approval of the people. Do you not think that's a contract? I don't have a view on that. I, 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 as a Russian journalist, I don't know what I have a view on is the fact that I believe that the judgment, that's right, that the 55% of Scotch support my politician. I believe that the majority of the minority are here who do not support the monarchy of British. I believe that the 80% of the Welsh people under the age of 30 are definitely British. I'm not going to prescribe that to be British, you have to be a monarchist or you have to be a Republican. I would say that I don't think the media is properly reflecting people who are, who are no doubt have grown up, but also the Scots can also trace back that they've been a, um, on this beautiful aisle for generations. I would suggest maybe them further back than the teacher was. Right, they're clearly British, right? They may not be British, they might want to break away from the United Kingdom. But the issue is, in the British, you will think taking that Britishness. And do you think, the view on whether they really try and be an impartial? Do you, do, you think, do you think it is or do you think it is not? Answer your no, own question. No, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think that, that the media is able to, or not able, is probably um, reflecting that large, it's a minority. Absolutely, the large, large polls is saying that overall, 58% of the population want to monarchy overall, but that is heavily skewed as you get older. And so I think that the okay. news media does have a problem with reflecting younger views. It does have a problem with affecting views as you move away from London. It does have a problem with ethnic minority. And I think people are Well, thank you very much for saying that. I mean, this is a constitutional monarchy. Uh, if government if the will of the people expressed in Parliament decides it's not going to be a monarchy, it won't be a monarchy. It's as simple as that. That's the way it's been set up since the Bill of Rights, since the 17th century. And it always be. Anyway, thank you for everybody for like, maintaining your silence and allowing me to do some of the talking. I hope everybody feels as if they have had a fair crack of the whip you know, to get over the points uh, that... Uh, You've been, made, you've been making it, you've all made so well. Uh, I just, as I say, I want to uh, congratulate uh, John Mayer and Andrew Beck uh, and their production team on getting this uh, volume out so promptly. It's full of good things, including your contribution. And uh, I think people have either got to delve into it, go out and buy a copy, you know, change the habit of a lifetime, uh, and uh, make good on what we've done tonight. So, Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for talking about reporting royalty. Thank you very much for contributing to it because it's a pretty little volume and I'm sure a lot of people uh, will take, uh, take it, it to their libraries and, and delve into it from time to time. So we are now coming to the end of our hour. Um, anything I can say is I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have and I hope that I have the pleasure a meeting person one may sit down. I, William, Prince of Wales, pledge my loyalty to you and faith and truth I will bear unto you as your liege man of life and limb. So help me God. <laughs>